It's a high-tech conversation. And a low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. I thought this week uh, we'd talk about our favourite woods. I remember last week we learned about boxwood, and it just got me thinking um, it's not the only favourite wood between all of us. I'm sure we've all got other favourites too. So, um, if you'd like to put, pop your name in the chat and you'll be asked to speak when it's your turn. Surprisingly, this week, no one's put their name in the chat already like we normally have. So, who's up for... Uh, well, Matthias is up for it then. Yep, I might as well. Uh, and no, I am not going to try to preempt... Uh, as it were, I, I don't have a dog in the who gets to talk about boxwood wars. I'll leave that fight to you, gentlemen. Uh, and I mean, same as when we were doing this uh, based on what's your favorite tool. It is of course very difficult to say what is your absolute favorite because one thing might be your favorite for one thing, one thing might be for another. And in my case, it's also just simply the fact that my experience with various types of wood is fairly limited. So there are many woods that I admire to look at Gat, but there aren't that many that I've actually worked with to any extent. So the candidates were the woods that I have worked with reasonably much would have been oak, maple, hard maple, sycamore, so European sycamore, uh, beech, but the winner uh was none of those but the humble but in my view oh so pretty ash this is just a small cut off from a project of mine i like ash one of my main reasons for liking it i'm i'm i am partial to the lighter woods i like i can very much admire uh the, the, the heavily colored ones or the, the darker colored ones, but I really like uh, the blonder woods. I also like the fact that ash is a tough wood, so it's, it's strong, but relatively easy to work. I like it because uh, it is less prone or it's easier to, to find uh, it's less prone, I find, to cathedrals than certain other woods, and I'm not so keen on cathedrals in all situations. You get, particularly if you have it rift sawn, you will get uh, simple, but in my in my eyes, quite attractive uh, pattern of of just uh, grain lines on 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 basically all surfaces. So this is flat sawn. This is quarter sawn. This is pretty much rift sawn, and they all look fairly similar. They all look they they all have the same stripy pattern, and I, I quite like that. Also, for a beginner like me, it has made the wood easier to work with because it's easier to to find pieces that match. Uh, and also because, like oak, uh, it's a ring porous wood, it arrives quite well. So you can you can uh, you can split it uh, in a way that you can't with many other woods. So that was my top and sort uh, of in in favor of ash, and that would be European ash. I have never tried the American varieties, but European ash. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Um, over to Josh. All right, uh, so I, I don't think this is quite my favorite, but I, I didn't know I'd be second, so I picked. I tried to pick one others wouldn't. Uh, and this is kind of an entry into what would you use if you don't have boxwood, uh, and, and it's dogwood. Uh, it's common as an ornamental tree in the US. It's not really harvested for lumber. This is kind of after some oil and wax. Uh, it, it's quite hard. It's very interlocked, which if you were as close as I am, you could, you know, it's 
a little bit kind of wavy texture in there. Uh, it doesn't split. This is uh, basically, this is a log that my parents cut from a tree they took down. Uh, and you do see some checking on the end. Uh, but I, I've tried to split it. Like, you know, I hammered a hatchet into it, trying to split it. And then I spent a much longer bit of time trying to get the hatchet out of the log. Uh, so so it's, it's very tough. It's good. It's very wear resistant. So you can use it as a wear strip like you might uh, with, with boxwood. Uh, this you know, is, is cherry. It would be one of my actual, like, it, cherry's nice to work with. Uh, dogwood is a pain in the butt to work with. Uh, but if you're going to beat things with it, uh, it's, it, it's a, it, or if you need something very wear resistant, it's a good choice. It used to be referred to as false box in the US and it was used for uh, like loom shuttles and, and, and mallets and pulleys and kind of uh, very utilitarian stuff. So I, I don't know if it would be a boxwood substitute and kind of the finer, you know, like I, I don't know if you would make an, an instrument out of it like you would with uh, boxwood or something. Uh, but for the kind of, you just need something durable and wear resistant uh, that's not gonna split kind of use, it's, it's quite good. All right, cheers, Josh. Um, we're over to Will. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, can you guys? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I just wondering if you can see. Um, I'm going to have to line this thing here. Why it's focusing on me. Um, there's a wood here that um, is maple. And I'm, I'm trying to show you what, what I got here. We're seeing you, Will. Yeah, I know. It doesn't seem to want to leave me. Probably some conspiracy from Apple. Okay. There we go. There we go. This is, um, sorry about that guys. First time I tried to do something like this. This is um, a mini bench top I built um, about a year and a half ago. It's actually all maple. The dark maple is roasted maple. And it's actually become one of my favorites. I, uh, the, the beam to my uh, panel guide, the handles to my, uh, uh, to, I'm using it for handles a lot. Um, I like maple, I like the roasted maple a lot. I also like to work with cherry. These are little accent pieces from scraps that we did for uh, things. This is my boxwood. It's from uh, South African boxwood. And that little piece of boxwood cost me about $30 Canadian. I planed it down from the rough stock. Uh, I've got another piece of rough about that length. Um, it's hard to find here. We don't get anything good. It's a very beautiful wood, very uh, creamy. But that's what I like. I like the roasted maple. Um, it's got a dark walnut cut to it. And um, it works really well. It turns very well, too. I'm not an expert turner. These projects for turning that I've been doing for the last little while is basically me learning how to turn. Uh, my wife gave me a Christmas present a few years ago, uh, which was essentially a, um, a lathe. And um, I started learning to turn. Those are some of my learning projects. So maple, roasted maple. I also like cherry. Um, my tool cap, wall cabinet behind me is primarily cherry and maple. Um, and it's kind of really nice to work with it. But I kind of like uh, working with stuff that's both roasted maple and uh, non-roasted maple, the combination. It's a, it's a very nice contrast. It, the roasted maple can be a little bit brittle, um, but I found that if you uh, 
give that area that you're working with a little bit of uh, BLO, it actually tools fairly well with a sharp chisel and you don't get the brittleness. You put a little bit of oil on it and it, uh, it kind of goes away. It becomes a little bit more tolerant. That's me. Any questions? Oh, yes, sorry. Buddy. The roasted maple is, um, I live in Ontario, Canada, um, about a four hour drive from the Lee Valley factory. Most of the wood they use on their handles this is uh, now is roasted maple. And so we can get it pretty uh, pretty cheap, and pretty um, um, easy now in the Ontario area. The, there's a surplus of it, I guess, from Lee Valley or something like that. And it's available, readily available to us. Sorry. Right, Here cheers, Will. I'm gonna move over swiftly over to Stephen. Swiftly over to Stephen. All righty. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing me. We're seeing you. Oh, I can spotlight you. There you go. There we go. All righty. Um, for me, it's rock maple. Um, I back in the uh, I think it was about 1984-85. I bought 300. Uh, feet of rock maple in the form of boards that were um, eight fourths by 12 inch by 10 foot long. And I cut it up with bandsaw. And um, I used the, the uh, two by four uh, cuttings, assembled them sideways, and that was my bench top which weighs about 450 pounds. And once it got polished up, it's like a bowling alley. Um, but with the cutoffs, I have a lot of cutoffs from going from 10 foot down to eight foot. And from those, I started redoing, uh, building saw handles. And so this is a, a saw handle that I made. I just took a modern day saw and re and reground some of it. This is one of my rip saws, but it's based on a, a handle I saw in a antique shop that intrigued me. It had all the wear marks of somebody had used the saw for a prolonged period of time. And so this fits my hand just perfectly. Now you may wonder what this is all about. Well, that's how I hold the saw when I'm doing straight up and down ripping. And um, it, it's, it's something of my own design, but I like the ergonomics of it. And it's based on a pistol grip uh, style, which is earlier than the 1840s that I'm using uh, these tools for. And so that's that's basically it. I'm I'm finding many uses for that rock maple. It's hard, it's hard as a rock. That's why they call it rock maple. I also like uh, highly figured maple, and I use that for gun stocks that I've made for myself. I've got a couple long guns that I muzzle loaders, and uh, the uh, highly figured. I, I I got a peeler core from somebody who is doing veneer work, but it was a, uh, a three, I'm sorry, a two and a two or two and a half inch by two and a half square that I oct carved down oct um, to an octagonal shape. And then as it got closer to the base, then um, I did a full taper on it. And I use that as my walking stick when I'm out in the forest because I can use it for measuring height and widths of trees. Um, that was part of my character when I was doing living history at Sutter's Fort. So for now, it's it's rock and figured maple. So I'm done. Next. All right, cheers, Stephen. Over to Tim, Tim Greenfield. If you're there. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, my favourite word is actually uh, cherry. Um, I find because I do a lot of um, boxes, a lot of dovetails. Um, you know, I've used 
quite loads and loads of species of wood, but I find cherry, I get the crispest corners um, on my tails. Uh, and I find that wood is absolutely phenomenal. Um, I go towards a beach. Uh, beach I use for a lot of my lids um, for boxes. Yes, it moves more than the cherry. Cherry is more stable. Um, but I do like the, I do like playing in beach. Uh, obviously you can play in beach in pretty much any direction you like. Um, and it seems to, it seems to, you know, have a shine either way, uh, how you approach it. Um, and very lately I've been working on a new project. Um, and I've actually grown fond of this wood, actually. A lot of people probably hate it. It's actually babinga. Um, I found, you know, when I first started using babinga, it's actually the first time I've actually used it. It's a nice rice, uh, nice red color. Um, it's got a, a lot of sort of uh, introversing grain in it as well. So it's very, very hard to tame. Um, but as long as you apply, you know, a, a small mouth on your plane and a very sharp blade, uh, I would probably recommend something like a PMB 11 or an 01 blade, but it doesn't, doesn't last long the 01s uh, it's a very very hard wood um i've actually grown to like it it's um it's a phenomenal um i'll actually show you what uh, what it's all about so we've got the uh, that's the uh, babinga and uh made a made out of a binger and oak so it's a, a little bit of rosewood on the side, Indian rosewood. That's another nice wood uh, I've worked with lately. But yeah, again, uh, I find more, you know, we're even working with those woods. Uh, cherry is probably my number one, number one wood to work with out of all of them. So yeah, that's me. I think this group would find it interesting, Tim, that the inlay you've actually got in the front of that panel with this drawer. Yeah, that's actually uh, the OSB, uh, OSB inlay. Um, not a very, not a furniture grade um, wood, I would say, more of an industrial, uh, but we've actually, we've actually turned that into furniture. And I've lined the uh, OSB with um, uh, Indian rosewood uh, border around the edge, around the drawer, um, and then sort of oak, and then inside the drawer, We've got our babinga back as well. Um, very, very nice that is. So it's a, it kind of looks, I, I've applied a little bit of wax to it. I did that yesterday uh, just to see what uh, the OSB would look like. And it actually looks like a figured maple. It's, uh, it's very nice. Was it quite porous? Was it, was it open grained when you started working with it? It was, yeah. I had to do a little bit of filling. Um, I had to actually get the OSB out and sand the OSB um, board just to get the uh, chippings, uh, even run it through my thickness, how to get some chippings, got some sawdust, and then every single void, I filled it in with either a chipping um, or, or some sawdust, and I've actually got it really, really smooth. Did you try match it at all? Did you, you said you were going to try a book match or a quarter match. Did you try that? I did try that. It didn't go so successful. I, I thought I'd just leave it. You know, it looks nice enough as it is, you know, with the OSB. Um, it does look, I've got a nice piece of it, I think. So it's a, uh, I think. All, all right, guys. Um, cheers, Tim. Cheers, mate. Thanks for showing off your box as well. Um, we're over to Scott now. Perfect, uh, Scott, that you spoke up there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I unmuted myself. Um, I don't have any here. Um, and this is going to be not controversial, but you guys probably are getting to grips with the fact that I'm who I am. And this goes from, it started when I was young as an apprentice. Um, in Scotland, um, a, a timber they used, and it'll be a construction grade timber. Um, but I'm not saying unusual, very, very commonly used in Scotland. And the two places I came across it were very, very different. Uh, one was for Joyce uh, in a house. So the tenement flats all had these for Joyce. And the first place I came across it was fire damage. And we had to cut out and replace, uh, obviously, burnt parts of joists for the floors. And it was quite a substantial amount of it getting cut out. So when the joiners got to take it home, um, or they didn't want it, it was offered to other people. And my dad, who I worked with at the time, actually had some. Um, I haven't mentioned what it is yet. Um, and I don't know if anybody's going to guess. I don't know yet. But um, so 
That and the other place we came across it was in a church. So it was used for pews in a church. Uh, I had the, the fortune with my dad again to be working on a job where the, the, the pews were actually left upstairs uh, covered in dust and we were told we could take them if we wanted. And that timber wasn't, um, it's not a hardwood. And uh, it's, it, it's not, uh, is that's the right answer. Thanks, Andy. Um, it's not a hardwood and it's got beautiful grain and it's very, very dense. The reason I found out it was dense was because we were hammering nails to actually join the timbers. And you could hear that, uh, that one of these sensory things that I remember. And I think wood's about sensory. And the other sensory part's going to come in a second. And that was the noise that the nails made when we were being hammered into it. And it made a do, 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 do. And then the nails bent. So the only way to actually fix nails into the pitch pine, which I'm talking about, pitch pine, was to actually pre-bore pre them um, and bore pilot holes in them, which kind of shocked me. But I think the old pitch pine that they used in Scotland, I'm not sure where it came from. Um, I thought obviously natural forest, I don't think natural forest, I think they're American possibly pitch pine. So I don't know why they would come all the way, bring all these boards or, or um, all the way across from America just to make houses in Scotland and pews. There's a story I don't know. But so it wasn't just that sensory effect of remembering that, but it's a smell. For me, guys, pitch pine has got the most gorgeous smell when you play it. Um, I, I, I've only just recently, and this is something else that you guys are learning is, I've only been working boxwood for a couple of weeks. You can judge me on that if you want. I've never worked rosewood. There's a lot of hardwoods I still haven't had a chance to actually work. Um, so my my experience is from probably what I would say is one of the one of the best um, softwoods there is, and that's pitch pine. Absolutely love the smell. Works beautifully. Smells beautiful. It's just every way whatsoever. It's just my favourite timber. Cheers, Scott. I, I know exactly what you mean with uh, pitch pine. It just it smells wonderful when I'm planing it as well. Um, well, you, you've just mentioned boxwood and uh, I think uh, King Boxwood or Lord Boxwood, whatever we like to call him, it's your turn. Watch you guys. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't going to talk about boxwood so I because uh, because I've been banned from talking about boxwood. So I thought I'd talk about actually pitch pine is one of my is actually my favorite softwood. It's beautiful. And um, along with uh, camphor wood, it's beautiful. Um, the uh, thing that goes with box, we don't have any native, I didn't think we had any native dark black trees in Britain until I bumped into Bob at Timberline, who introduced me to uh, Bog Oak. And um, so, since then, Crescent Temple, um, and particularly Richard Arnold, uh, I think it's on holiday this week, um, made a beautiful plough plane out of Bog Oak. Um, but years and years and years and years and years ago, I bought uh, a, a lump of bog oak, which says it was, um, it came off the production line around about 3,500 years before Christ, um, produced by a tsunami from uh, a collapsing glacier in, in Scandinavia that, that caused a, uh, a tidal wave across East Anglia. And it knocked all the oak trees down and they lay in the um, they lay in the uh, peat bogs anaerobically in uh, Norfolk and, and various parts of East Anglia and were buried at one on top of the other. And as uh, the oceans have receded and um, the land <coughs> was reclaimed in, in East Anglia and the fenland was drained for agricultural purposes, the farmers started to dig it up. And um, it was actually an obstruction because it damaged all their plowshares and um, caused a lot of havoc. They had to dig out the, the trunks and, and they set ceremoniously burnt them, which is an utter shame. Uh, recently, there's been drying techniques that have, uh, have been um, uh, perfected, uh, particularly uh, low, lows down in, um, in Surrey, uh, Sussex. But anyway, they, they have... Um, they have some of the machines that, that control the drying process because once it gets into the air, it starts to, it starts to crack and rot. And, and you know, it's basically had 5,000 years of thinking about rotting and then all of a sudden it's allowed to. So it's dried in a kiln, uh, has to be, and, it's, um, and, it, and it forms this utterly beautiful, and I was trying to get it in the, in the light correctly, but you can see the medullary rays of a tree 
that was um, there you go and and dendrochronology that the art of um, working out how old something is by looking at the tree rings and comparing them with similar samples um, uh, dates it from, uh, and carbon dating uh, dates it from a period around about three thousand a half years before Christ um, Andy Ponder pondered, pondered down in um uh, the famous box maker to royalty. He actually made, I think, the ring box for Harry and Meghan. Um, he uses it extensively. Uh, he sent me a piece here, which you could probably just see what work out what I was going to or am going to do with it. Um, and this piece is just big enough for um, there you go for creating a panel saw handle, uh, which will be I I can only assume one of the most beautiful. It is. You can see here where the heartwood and sapwood and various la layers have, have, have actually leached up the blackness. And, and, and if you look very carefully, you can see flecks of, flecks of gold within the wood, which is leached out of the salt water uh, when it was originally hit. There was a, a vast amount of gold in, in salt water um, and it, uh, it, it percolated and, and, uh, within, the, within the wood. But this is how it looks when it's when it's rough cut and you can see how much you know this is a, a piece that Richard gave me he said well let's see if we can get something out of that but it's actually that was starting to deteriorate and and if it's not if it's not kiln dried you could literally you can literally scrape it off as if it as if it's you know had its 5,000 years of rotting a beautiful native English wood <clears throat> and our only black wood cheers cheers Jim uh got Tim's name again in the chat. I think that might be a mistake. Over to uh, Jeremy. All right. Uh, so I thought a lot of people would, I was, it was the same sort of thing. I thought I'd pick up one of my favorite woods that's not maybe my a real favorite, <laughs> which is probably the one I've used the most um, That's that I like to work with is walnut. But I kind of assumed somebody else would talk about that, but maybe not. I don't know. Uh, uh, it's somewhat common around here in the Midwest uh, United States to get walnut and it's just really nice to work with. But the one I was going to talk about was apple, which uh, I really like and probably because I haven't worked with boxwood, but it's sort of in the same vein, a very hard, very glossy um, surface to work with, but it's like it's really just carves with like a buttery ease in some ways. So uh, I haven't got a chance to use it all that much, but I, I really like uh, apple because of the, the streaky nature of, of much of the wood and then it's just kind of a hard burnished uh, shiny surface that uh, it works takes really well to carving and fine details and things like that. I think it's probably uh, underrated because it's not really uh, domestically uh, achievable to, to process a lot I think uh, and it's just small pieces and things like that so it's just not really convenient for a lot of, of stuff but I really uh, I do really like working with apple um, and it just seems like it's uh, always a treat to work with it whenever I find some some of it. Uh, in particular, I like this streaky color where you get the, the dark color and uh, a light color. And they both seem to, you know, carve equally well. Like it's not like a soft versus hard, but it's uh, it's uh, just a, a really fun work, wood to work with. And that's all. Um, cheers, Jeremy. That was uh, quite brief, nice and concise. Uh, over to Bruce. Um, years ago, I came into a bunch of Hinoki, and if I had to pick one, um, you know, everything about it, working it is just great. It smells great, feels great. It planes up just absolutely wonderful. It's a nice, tight grain. Um, this is a drawer from a 36 drawer tansir I made for my wife. And um, as I said, if I had to pick one, it'd probably be it. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Can I ask you some questions about it? Yep, absolutely. Wait for it, Rusty. So I've never worked with Hinoki. I know it's popular in Japan. Right. And I know Hinoki from Bonsai. Right. What is it like? Is it hard? Is it um, easy it's to It's a softwood. Softwood, OK. Um, but they it's use conifer, it I know in, that. I mean, they use it in uh, uh, structure, like historical structures now. Um, in fact, I, I got this from um, well, 20 years ago, 21, I was a lone American sub flunky 
on a re-roofing re project at a historical Japanese house here. And I was pulling Pinocchi out of the dumpsters and one of the guys said, Bruce, you building doghouse? But um, it, uh, I'll send you a piece if you like. Um, um, that's very kind. Um, I don't think I'm ready just yet, but maybe I can come pick it up. Well, I said a small piece, but anyway. Um, but it is, it's, um, and they use the bark for, for the roofs. Okay, so similar, if, if to, white, uh, similar to white cedar? E-ish. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but. Uh, Thanks. Yep. All right, cheers guys. Uh, here we go. Uh, well, sorry, should have not spot unspotlighted uh, Rusty, because Rusty, you're next. Hey, um, so uh, I, I feel like the, the wood I was going to talk about, again, it's, it's really hard to pick a favorite, right? Because it sounds like for every lumber, there is something that it excels at. Um, I really thought somebody will mention oak by now, and Jim mentioned petrified oak, which is not really oak. As in, it, I don't think how, how much of a uh, um, tensile strength the petrified oak has or bog oak has, but white oak and red oak have a tremendous amount of uh, tensile strength, which is why it's used for really thin spindles and chair making. Um, the wood I was gonna talk about is white pine. And mainly for a reason that it's really hard for me to get white pine for chair seats. Uh, there's white pine, eastern white pine, it grows in Georgia, but it grows really fast and it gets hard, uh, heavy, and really pitchy. Uh, white pine that I know people use for chair seats um, comes from the north of Michigan or north of northeast, and people will actually drive for days and get a truckload and drive it down. Um, white pine is very soft, very uh, nice to uh, carve. It's very, very stable. It does not move much once it's dry. Um, I check the sharpness of my tools on N-grade white pine. If the tool is not sharp, it will bend the fibers instead of cutting them. But planing white pine, carving by white pine, um, reaming, scraping it, or reaming the, the mortises in it, it it's an absolutely wonderful experience when you have a really old piece you know, with growth rings, maybe an eighth of an inch apart. Um, and again, it's hard to get here. And so everybody's kind of on the lookout for chair maker who's going out of business who might be selling their stash. Um, I don't know how it relates to pitch pine, but, um, and, and I've, I've heard people starting to move to other woods for chair seats. Um, but for me, white pine is the king. That's it. Cheers, Rusty. So I thought I would squeeze myself in and talk about my favourite wood. Well, I'm sure a lot of you will remember when we first uh, started off on Bench Talk, there was a joke. Not Purple around. Heart, is it? Well, no, no, it's not Purple Heart, but I thought it had to be mentioned. Um, purple Heart was a favourite because purple is my favourite colour. Um, it was at one time a favourite and it it really does polish up beautifully. And I've been playing around with different woods for marking gauges. And there are certain woods I've enjoyed working with, some woods I've absolutely loathed, but still push, pushed through and done it. An example <laughs> is Jatoba. It looks, it actually looks better in, in person rather than on this video. Um, but I really hated working with it. I just, it wasn't a pleasant experience. And then uh, the walnut, which I used for the stem, it actually looks quite beautiful and I didn't expect it to look the way it does on this stem. And it, it's just, uh, it's stunning. I, I think I'll, I'd really like to use more walnut for stems. But my favorite is Catalox. And I forgot to grab a piece from the shed, but it, it looks like a rosewood but it's even tighter grained. The, the, the grain is even closer and it polishes up to a higher shine than rosewood does just naturally. It's a, um, 
and actually I was up at Bill's on uh, Bill Carter's on Tuesday and I was we put this wood next to a piece of rosewood that he had and looking at the color and the grain it didn't look any different it looked like the same species except this one could take a better polish than than rosewood and it's less sought after and therefore I would consider it a bit more sustainable but the only issue is it has a severe blunting effect if you're trying to plane it and I have to sharpen up every three or four passes with my plane otherwise it tears the grain so yeah that's my favorite and of course there's there's boxwood there as well Frenick have, have you seen um sapwood of catalogs uh yes I have and it's uh, but I've not not in person I've seen um pictures of it yeah it's it's almost as wide as boxwood and, and it's just as hard okay I have to try yeah. and get some the, the only thing I will caution you is if you're uh, sending it, wear a mask. I had the worst asthma attack ever after sending catalog. Good to know. Uh, right, we're over to uh, Andy Tuckwell. Okay. Um, my favorite wood um, is one I've used on virtually every project. Um, I've used it on uh, shelves, boxes, um, bookcases, a couple of beds, chair, um, virtually everything I make, I use this wood. And it's free wood. It's wood that I've found in skips, that I've rescued from old furniture, that I've got from other people's offcuts, stuff that's been um, chucked away by somebody else. And whether it's um, ordinary softwood, you know, nice redwood, um, uh, Douglas fir, oak, sweet gum. Sweet gum's lovely stuff. Uh, popular in Victorian furniture, well worth uh, using again. Piranha pine, can't buy it anymore, but there's plenty around if you know where to look. Walnut, beech, mahogany, holly, cherry. Um, I had a lovely experience a few years ago. I bought some old woodworking books on eBay um, from a guy down in Somerset. Um, popped in at his house to collect them because they were heavy. His house was stacked all around with um, mostly a dig bow and a few other tropical hardwoods. There was a place nearby that made um, summer houses and uh, such like, and he got all their offcuts. He couldn't bear to burn it. He wanted to give it away to other woodworkers. So, you know, there's quite a few Edigbo projects I've made for, for other people along the way. But, you know, that's the best way to find a big variety of woods, find out what you like, um, grab it whenever it's going and experiment and find out and just use the stuff. Free wood, best wood to go in. Cheers, to Andy. I'm just the same as you. I do a lot of skip hunting for larger pieces of wood. You're doing people a favour. You're giving them some spare room that they can fill up with something else. And you're so, how do you identify that that species? Is it by ingrain, or how do, how do you find that one, Andy? Like <laughs> um, the, the the only hard one, I think. If on it's the not list nailed down, the, um, the sweet gum, um, which is also called satin wood, I think. Um, and it was from an online discussion showing people pictures of it, describing the working properties and the, the time it was used. Um, and it's such a shame that woods like that come and go and they're so, so good to use, they get used up and they disappear. Um, and, you know, obviously it's a very green thing to do to, um, to reuse something that's uh, destined for landfill or burning. Right, uh, should we move over to Richard Hughes? Yeah, good evening. Good evening, Richard. Okay, so yeah, I, I'm going to talk about um, uh, paddock. Um, I, I came across it by accident, really. I, I went into SL Hardwoods um, to ask about uh, uh, some ebony. I had a, a mind to get to ebony to make tool handles with, but I was just horrified at the price. We wanted 200 pounds for a decent sized chunk of um, 
of ebony. So I said, no, thanks very much. What else have you got? So they showed me various things, in including a, a chunk of pad oak, so, which was much cheaper. So I thought, OK, I'll, I'll try that. And uh, I took it away. And, and I've, uh, I've been using pad oak to make quite a lot of, uh, of tool handles with, and, and also used it for musical instrument making in uh, uh, things like fret, uh, fretboards and um, fingerboards and, um, and bindings. So um, when you cut cut into it, it's um, it's a most outrageous shade of orange. It's very striking, uh, but it doesn't last very very quickly. It uh, it starts to go dark, and it just goes darker and darker with age. And in the end, it turns out to a sort of very dark red color, a bit like the the, the covers of old of some old um, leather covered books. Um, and I, yeah, I've got, I've got to like it really. So yeah, here's here's a here's a, uh, a chunk of of pad oak on this on this plane handle and you can see it's it's gone on a very dark red color hopefully um yeah it's rather difficult to work and uh, it produces quite an unpleasant uh, dust which stains your clothes uh, so i think it needs to be treated with, with respect but um, yeah anyway that's that's it pad oak here's richard um i think we're over to uh well actually i remember seeing some of your planes uh and i just thought i'd mentioned that the color on your planes it was actually quite um i, I know it, it changes color so drastically and i've seen that it's almost like orange dust everywhere my hands went orange last time i used uh, padauk but your planes just look the, the color of them just looks beautiful it suits them really well yeah oh, thanks uh rick all right, um, so I have a couple of favorites. One, real quickly, is um, is pecan. And it's a wood that um, I think most people think is quite difficult to work with, and I would agree. But I what I really love about this is um, when you use a chisel on it. Uh, I, I've done a lot of pairing uh, with the grain, with the stuff, and it gives like a nice pop, 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 pop as you cut through it. And I just really get a kick out of it. So that's probably my favorite wood to work. Um, in that one situation. But uh, another favorite, this is one of the first hardwoods I ever discovered and actually owned. I was at a hardwood store and saw it and thought, hey, that looks cool. Um, didn't really, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know the name of it or anything. Um, it has a little bit of a very tight, uh, like a um, lace wood type of a, a look to it. Uh, it's called uh, Loro Prado. And, um, I didn't know what it was. I threw it into my pile of wood for ages and then pulled it out one day and said, hey, I'm going to try and make a pencil out of it. And it's probably the most popular what I use. Um, and uh, it it just to look at all the different sides, you know, like the, the face grain. Uh, sorry, that's quarter sawn side, the uh, the uh, flat sawn side, um, all the different sides just has just the most remarkable grain. I really enjoy it. So those are probably my two favorites. Cheers, Rick. Rick, do you know where it's from? No idea. Um, I should know that. Um, I'm going to guess like uh, Central America or uh, South America. I don't Thanks. know for sure. Yeah. Good luck. All right, we're over to Mitch. Mitch's world of woods. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I like to stick with the natives when I can uh, and when it's appropriate. And, and I'm not known for turning. I'm not a turner, but I like to turn you. And uh, it just looks so lovely. It's orangey color for the heartwood. And it's also got a lovely pale sapwood, which makes a nice contrast on bowls and the like. So for me this evening, it's you. Oh, I didn't realise it was me. <laughs> well, I think uh, well, I think we should invite Jim to talk about his beloved boxwood because I think he really, really was itching with his oh, no, I wasn't. sitting right behind. I wasn't. Him. I wasn't. Loro, Loro Preto is from Brazil, and it's um, it is a cordia. Cordia melanlantha. So it's a tropical American, South American hardwood. 
um, diffuse porous, and it's rated as very durable and it has a pleasant characteristic scent to it. But you have to be careful, as with any of the rosewood, cocoa bolo, and all those sort of species that it's that it's recommending not to uh, not to get it on your skin or breathe it in because of uh, our reactions to it. Uh, I also yeah, I found it very easy to work. It's a it's one of the easier rosewoods I think to work. It's not interlocking or it doesn't have that interlocking nightmare to it. Yeah, it doesn't appear to be a true dull Berger rosewood. So it's of but it's of that ilk. You know, it's of the yeah. tropical rainforest and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it is uh, it is an amazing wood. Uh, I've tried some of it once and. Uh, Sadly, don't have any more, but yeah, uh, Trini, boxwood. Trini, can I ask Mitch a quick question? Go for it, Mitch. Working with you, so I know that you can be poisonous. Yeah, have you experienced any reactions? Uh, none at all, and I'm still alive, so I guess it can't be that bad. The, 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 you have to be very, very careful though, Mitch, because you might not necessarily be yourself because you, some people are just totally resistant to any any toxins that, that are wood, but the particular toxins within you are uh, very fatal, Please. can be fatal, uh, depending on- um, Particularly to horses. Yeah, so absolutely, uh, about yeah, the but, but it's actually a poison, no, no. It's actually a, a taxin which is, if you look it up, taxin is one of the neurotoxins and it can, it can affect the heart. It can stop your heart, it can stop respiratory systems, anything like that. And that's every single part of the uterine, including the wood um, and the leaves and uh, particularly, you know, obviously eating it. But well, the, the fruit, dust... The fruits are edible. Sorry? The fruit is edible. I... I all I knew was when I looked at it, because I got a quite a bad reaction to you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, I was making a, the bow saw that I made out of the two fingers bow saw, um, which um, using the same principle as the, as the uh, uh, longbow, um, using heartwood and sapwood. And I got quite a bad reaction to, apart from the fact that the, it tears out before, you know, you really have to have a sharp, sharp uh, yeah. Yeah. tool. Um, but uh, I looked it up, and, and it is ta taxin is one of the, the sort of things that Miss Marple would use to kill the butler or something. Yeah, definitely. Mitch, uh, but you never had any any reactions? No, I didn't. But um, when I turn, I do have a face mask on uh, with a respirator in it, so I'm not getting a, an awful lot of contact with it. Uh, just, just. And it sounds like you are less of a horse than Jim is. <laughs> yeah, I didn't like to say that myself. <laughs> just, just because this is going out into the ether uh, about uh, you, you mentioning of the fruit being edible. The yeah. fruit is the only part uh, which is edible, but not the core. Yeah. So you, you have to be very, very careful. We use it for marmalade in Austria, and for cham. But if, if there is just one tiny little core in it, it has loads of the taxin in it, and it's brutally poisonous. So you, you can eat the flesh, but you have to be very careful to remove anything but the red fruit flesh. Just, just a caveat. Yeah, good idea. I think I think you can get it on your skin. Obviously, if you're not if you're not absorbing that, the, if you're not leaving it on your skin, I mean, I use exactly the same as you. I use a, a full face, full face mask when I'm creating any dust of any wood um, with a with a, uh, you know, forced air full stair jet, jet mask, uh, which you've got to use for turning. I don't see any other way around it. Um, but I use barrier cream, Artists uh, Windsor & Newton barrier cream all over my skin beforehand. So it gives you the dexterity. You should never use a, obviously, you should never use gloves on any turning equipment. Um, but, um, you know, if you, put, if you put barrier cream on, that will, that will prevent, uh, the, my, my worst reactions are with Coco Bolo, without doubt. It is, it is, I just have to look at it and I, I go bright and, and break out into a rash. Um, it's a nasty piece of stuff. And I understand desert ironwood is the same. Jim, Jim, I, um, I, I, I had a reaction to boxwood as well. 
Um, oh yeah, I know. Yeah, you just I, can't afford it. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I had a, I had a yeah. reaction to boxwood after the first time I used it, and I just fell in love with it. Yeah, that was the yeah. reaction I had. That's the reaction you had. Yeah, yeah. And then you realised. Well, yeah, I know you're itching to tell us. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm no, not no. Addicted. Okay, fine. Then we're over to Adam. I'm not addicted. I'm not addicted. Let Adam talk. Me. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. My uh, the wood that I'm using a lot at the moment. Uh, is uh, sessile oak, which is a, uh, a Baltic oak. Um, and um, I live in uh, Denmark and I can buy it just down the road uh, very cheaply. Um, the reason I like it is I can process it um, very easily with uh, ax an axe and wedges. Uh, so I can reuse the timber um, and it gives the most amazing water storm timber. Um, well, quarters timber. You see these amazing uh, blobs of uh, ray parenchyma here, this silvery stuff. And uh, I carve it a lot. Um, and uh, What's I, the name, I, Adam? Sorry? What is the name of that timber? Yeah, it's, it's Sessile Oak, it's called. Uh, Quercus Petraea is the, um, is the Latin name. Um, in uh, in England, we call it Baltic oak because it was imported from obviously from the Baltic states um, after the Great Fire of London, uh, and uh, a lot of the interiors within London um, are, are created out of this stuff here, um, and uh, it's very straight grained. Um, it, it's very different to. Um, Quercus robo, which is the English oak, um, in that we can um, you can split this very easily because it's quite a tall tree, has a very slender trunk. Uh, it can grow up to 11 meters um, before you get to the first branch on the crown. So it looks like a pine tree in straightness. Uh, it's very clear, um, and um, I, I use it a lot here. Um, because of ease of processing and uh, it carves quite nicely. Uh, although it's a bit crumbly, this stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting historic timber. Uh, I do a lot of uh, research into the historic London interior work. And uh, it's, it's my go to wood, really. So there you go. That's my favourite. Adam, can you spell? How do you spell the name? Sessile, S E double S I L E, I believe. I believe. I -L -L -E. Thank you. It looks absolutely beautiful, but I've never heard that name. Yeah, no, it's um, it's it's one of the it's it's very sort of a, it's it's sold as uh, European oak. Um, the, the 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 stockists in in England call it. Uh, Quercus roba, which is oak, basically, um, English oak, uh, and um, they don't really call it uh, its proper name. Uh, I think if, uh, if they did, a lot of people run away from it because it's, uh, it's just kind of an unknown. Um, but it does grow, it grows in the UK as well, but it all gets bundled together um, as, um, as European oak. And it gets labelled Quercus robur because it's indistinguishable between um, uh, the, the, the penuncular oak, which is the Quercus robur, and the Quercus oak. They're very difficult to, uh, to distinguish once it's, once it's cut up. Uh, the only way to tell the difference is by looking at the acorn. Um, and, uh, but it's softer the... than white oak? Pardon me? Is it softer than white oak? Well, it is a white oak. Um, we don't have uh, Quercus alba, which is the American white oak um, here, um, but it is one of the, the white oaks. Okay. You've, got the, you've got the red oak and the white oak. Haven't you? Absolutely so, beautiful. I've never heard that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very nice. It's a very nice timber. Um, it's a bit. It's a bit niche, really. But it grows really well here and it's very cheap. 
Mm-hmm. Adam, can I ask, does it have as much tannins as um, English or uh, English oak? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's got a lot of tannin in it. Because what I find with oak is that, if, especially carving, is that um, my fingers go black and then the timber gets really, really grubby looking quite quick. Oh, uh, yeah, because that's because you sweat, old bean, isn't it? Uh, you don't, I don't have sweaty hands, you see, so I don't get that blackness coming. Uh, if, you've got, if you've got sort of sweaty hands, you get... Um, you get a stain on, uh, and uh, some people have to wear gloves when they carve it. Um, but I'm I'm lucky that I'm not a fan of wearing gloves when I carve. I just I don't I don't like wearing. I don't feel as if I get the same contact with the the tools when I'm using gloves. No, definitely not. No, I, I do. Um, but it is it's got very high tanning content. It's got very high um, acidic. So it's full of acetic acid, um, just like um, English oak as well. So. You leave your tools on it when it's green, it will go blue um, and it will uh, it'll stain your tools. Yeah. Is, is, the, is that panel you carved, is it just flat on the back of it? I mean, is it flat on the back, the, the panel that you've carved there? Uh, yeah, I just, um, well, it's a ribbon. I, panel. I know that the, the carving's beautiful, but can we see the other side? Yeah, you can see oh. the other side. There we go. Look, uh, oh, it's just been carved out. We can't, oh, you can see the grain on it there. Yeah, so this is. You see uh, the middle of it, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah, this is a scrub plane. Um, so, so it's ribbon. You can see. Um, I don't know if you can see the uh, the ring um, goes straight across the board to get the quarters. Um, yeah, so it's not it's not sawn. It's split, um, and then um, so I can split it quite. I can split it quite thin um, down to um, a quarter of an inch if I want to. So straight. You've got no spiral grain. Um, and then I flatten the back uh, with a uh, with a scrub plane. So it's all it's all historically correct. This yeah, is part the culinary reason are beautiful. Yeah, it's nice. The cavern's, nice, the, the cavern's nice as well, by the way. Yeah, I'm not so happy with it. I I cocked up the leaves, but you know, are you, Adam? I don't think you've spoke before, have you? No, I haven't. No. Where are you? What? Where are you, where are you based? I'm, I'm in Denmark. Um, but I, I study on the, on the, um, at the City and Guilds uh, College in London uh, when I'm allowed to go there, but I, I can't get there at the moment, so uh, I'm studying no, I didn't there think, at the moment. I yeah. didn't think you were in England because the way you spoke, you sounded like you were at Scan- in Scandinavia somewhere, but I didn't know. No, no, I'm from London. Oh, great. Another Londoner. I am. Just like me very then. Very London, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. um, Adam. If you if you ever not happy with your mistakes, I would be happy to take all of them. <laughs> I've got a lot. That's of beautiful mistakes. work, Adam. <laughs> well, well, this is around the time where I'm going to ask everyone to unmute and raise their glasses or their drinks or whatever bench beverage you're drinking and uh, raise a glass to tonight to everyone who spoke tonight and uh, everyone who joined us just to listen and watch, and to the bench. Anton's already ahead of us. He's already downed it. Yeah. Great to the bench. Bench, 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 bench. To the bench. To the bench. To the bench.